and Dr. Felice Gersh, your integrative OBGYN physician. We are approaching the holiday season. I can hardly believe it. It's mid-November as I am speaking to you right now. But even if you listen to this down the road, there's always something coming up. An anniversary, a birthday, or just having fun. And what happens during these times? Often, we choose badly. We choose to eat foods that maybe shouldn't even deserve the label food because they don't have any nutritional value, or maybe they're full of high fructose corn syrup, or they're actually lacking in fiber and vital nutrients. Maybe they're full of unfortunate chemicals like different types of emulsifiers or flavors, preservatives, all kinds of chemicals gets into our food. Have you ever looked at the label when you go through the grocery store's aisles? It's kind of like shocking, right? So if you sometimes eat the right foods, but sometimes eat the wrong foods, there's a high probability that you have a dysbiotic gut microbiome. Dysbiotic means abnormal life forms. So we got to address this if we want to have optimal health. Now, what else can affect our gut microbial population? Lack of adequate sleep, high levels of stress, hormonal imbalances of all sorts. So there's a variety of things. And other chemicals that get into our bodies, like from water, sometimes our public water supply can have some very unfortunate things in it. And of course, through our skin and in other ways, even like breathing, we can have air pollution and all of this can impact our gut microbial population. When that happens, you're going to have problems with the liver. So it turns out that the liver is part of the gastrointestinal system and it's very closely linked to the gut, to the intestinal tract. There in fact is even what is called the enterohepatic circulation. Entero meaning gut, hepatic meaning liver, and they connect in such very vital and intricate ways. So when you have gut dysbiosis of the microbiome, abnormal life forms, you're going to have problems with your liver. In addition, you will have problems with the health and integrity of the gut lining, and it will become impaired. We call that leaky gut, because if you don't have the right microbial population, in conjunction, the right microbes with our own natural cells, like the panna cells, the goblet cells, they create this incredible protective mucus coating to protect the lining cells of our gut from being up close, touching the toxins that are in the gut, in the intestinal lumen. And when you don't have the right microbiome, you're not going to get that protective coating and the toxins called endotoxins, also known as lipopolysaccharides, they get right up to the lining and they cause the little fibers that hold the cells together in what we call tight junctions to become disintegrating. And then the cells move apart. And then you have what we call leaky gut, where the gut contents that are toxic get into the body proper. So there's a host of things that can go awry and can lead to problems with our intestinal tract. And what about the liver? I mentioned that when you have gut dysbiosis, you're gonna have problems in the liver. So why do you care? What does the liver even do? Well, the liver is a powerhouse in terms of what it does. It's like vital to, to life. So it's the master detoxification organ of the body. So we have toxins that we make from our own metabolic processes. Okay, and we've got to get rid of them. We also have a host of toxicants, chemicals that come in from the outside world that we need to detoxify. We call that biotransformation to try to eliminate them from the body. Some of the elimination occurs through the gut, through our bowel movements with the, the fecal material, and some gets transformed into a water-soluble form so it can then be 
removed from the body through the kidneys. We also can sometimes breathe things off and sweat things off as well that are toxic. But the liver is the main site of detoxification. The liver also is a manufacturing center. It makes various types of proteins and such. And of course, it's a manufacturing center for converting glycogen into glucose. It helps to produce blood sugar called glucose. But if you have an abnormal, unhealthy liver, you will have abnormal production of glucose, too much. And that's not good because then you have too high of a blood sugar. It's also the site of what else? The production of 90% of the cholesterol that circulates in the bloodstream is produced in the liver. And fats, triglycerides, are also produced there. In addition, when you have gut dysbiosis, you're also more likely to have what's now called hepatic metabolic steatosis, previously known as non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Now, this is all prelude to getting into what we're really here to talk about is the vegan detox. But you got to know why you're going to do it, right? If you're going to even think about doing such a thing, you have to think, what is the point? There's always a point to doing something, I hope, right? It's not just unless it's just to have fun. Well, that's a point in itself. And I think, really, that doing the vegan detox can be fun because there's amazing foods that are on this diet. Now, when we say detox, it's really important to define that a little better. I and nobody else can just take chemicals and toxicants and the body waste and just make them exit your body. I wish I had that power. So when we say detox, what I mean, and I hope everyone else means it when they say it, is that we're helping to facilitate the body's innate mechanisms for detoxification. So really, it's a facilitation of the detoxification pathways, predominantly in the liver. So when we say vegan detox, we are saying using vegan foods, you can promote the detoxification pathways so that you can get rid of our endogenous, our own produced, and exogenous from the outside world, toxicants, the poisons that can really create great harm because these can also cross the blood-brain barrier into our brains. These create inflammation. These are harmful. So let's talk about vegan foods. And why would I say go vegan? Now, I am not a vegan. I am what I like to call vegan plus. So I define that as mostly vegan, mostly plant-based, but a little bit of animal, about three ounces on average a day. That would be like having a very large egg or two very small eggs. It would be like having the equivalent meat that you would find on a typical sized thigh of a chicken or a drumstick of a chicken, like maybe three large shrimp, So we're not talking a lot here. You know, it would be like three ounces of a little steak. So it's not a lot, but it's adequate. As long as you're getting adequate protein from your plant intake. And there are many sources of plant-based proteins. Now, what I'm recommending is if you can for six months, but if you can't go for three months, if you can't go for one week to go pure vegan, and then when you can't, if for any reason you feel you just can't continue as a vegan, then go like I am, vegan plus. Now, I am vegan plus now, but if I wanted to do the detox, I would go pure vegan for about six months. But like I said, if you can't go six months, that's our goal. It's always good to have a goal, but you can always fall short of the goal, and that doesn't mean you failed. It just means You didn't make that goal this time, but you still did a good thing. Now, why did I say to go vegan? And like I said, I am what I call vegan plus, because when you do not have the healthiest gut microbiome, you do not process animal protein properly. You need the right gut microbes to properly deal with 
animal protein. So you've got to first reestablish that healthy gut microbiome before you add in animal, because what will happen is when you have the gut microbes and then they're presented with uh, animal protein and they're not the right microbes they're going and they don't have the right fiber they're not getting the, enough of the right food then what happens is they they do what they have to do to survive and they'll start the there's a lot of the commensals the good guys die some other bacteria will survive usually not the good ones the the bad ones that we don't want the pathogens and so on and they'll turn the protein from the animal into toxic nitrogen products and other products that are really toxic like TMA and then the liver turns that into TMAO which is a toxic substance and also is a marker for cardiovascular disease. So we don't want to take our good beautiful microbes and then starve them by giving them all that animal and then have the when you don't have the right microbial population and you have dysbiosis to make toxic products from that animal protein. So I'm not saying be a vegan forever. Try to go vegan for six months. But if you can't, just try even one week and then add just a tiny bit of animal. But if you can do vegan for six months, your gut microbial population will be so much better, so restored. So if you think about what are in plants, well, one of the big things is fiber. Now, there is magical other ingredients we're going to talk about in plants. But fiber is the essence of the food for your gut microbiome. So when I say detox, and I'm saying I want to facilitate that, where does the detoxification process begin? In the intestinal tract. That's phase one. So you need to have that healthy gut microbiome and you need to repair the leaky gut. So you have to nurture and care for your trillions of little friends, the trillions of microbes that inhabit the gut, the gut microbiome. And they are starving, literally starving, if you don't give them a variety of fibers. And their gut microbes, not only are there trillions, but there are thousands of different types. And they all have personal preferences, just like you have personal preferences. And some like certain types of fibers more than other types of fibers. So you want the array of fibers. You want to have insoluble. You want soluble. You want to have all the different types of starches. Notice I said the word starch. That is not a bad word. That is a good word because that is what feeds our gut microbes that are now recognized as essential for health and for proper detoxification. In fact, and I've touched on this in other episodes, that there's a special part of the gut microbiome called the astrobolome that's designed specifically for the detoxification of estrogens and recycling of estrogens when it's appropriate through the production of the enzyme that can actually convert processed or what we would say conjugated estrogens back into the unconjugated form so it can be released by the beta-glucuronidases. Those are the enzymes that can help release and recycle estrogens when it's appropriate. But if it's not appropriate and you have the wrong gut microbiome, you can have inappropriate recycling. So the gut microbiome is part of the detoxification pathway. This is really important to know. So that's why we're focusing so much on a vegan diet with lots and lots of different fibers. Now, We want to have a diverse gut microbiome. We don't want to have just one or two types. We want thousands of different types. So we have to eat diverse types of fibers. So what kind of foods would I be talking about that are vegan, that have wonderful fibers? The legume family, every kind of bean, and also lentils. Now, if you don't like beans for whatever reason, pick garbanzo beans. Who doesn't like garbanzo beans? I'm sure there's one or two of you out there, but they're so versatile. You can make hummus. You can just pop them into salads. You can put them into making different kinds of Greek dishes. I mean, there's, you know, you can make them into like little, almost like 
fake meatballs, you know, with just garbanzo beans, but little little balls of them. So there's so many ways that you can use garbanzo beans. But there's pinto beans, there's navy beans, there's black beans, you know, there's so many different beans. And then there's the pea family. So you can have split pea soup and, and you can have just peas out of the pod. And lentil soup is one of my Oh, I just love lentil soup. So if you don't know recipes for these different foods, then go get online and or go to the, the bookstore, or go to the library. There are so many vegan cookbooks that have all kinds of recipes with beans. Who doesn't love chili, right? So chili is from beans and you can have bean salad. Have you ever had like a five bean salad? I love cannellini beans in a salad. So get some recipes. Beans are fantastic. And like I said, lentils are wonderful. And peas, so forgotten as a food. And these are so affordable. They're like so much less expensive than like having a big steak or, you know, seafood. Oh my gosh, I love seafood, but have you seen the cost of a really quality fish? So stick for now when you're doing your vegan detox to having a lot of legumes. What else? The ancient grains have amazing fiber. So a lot of people never even heard of these foods, these foods like buckwheat. Buckwheat, not buckwheat pancakes. That's not what I'm talking about. We want to cook these like rice. So it's the whole ancient grain. So we have buckwheat and millet. You know, in India, they love millet and they're part of their diet. In many other places, millet is like a mainstay. And I love millet. So give it a try. You can use it in dishes. You can use it like a cereal. You can use it in place of rice. And it has a unique flavor. And it's really, really tasty. And then, so we have buckwheat. We have millet. Quinoa. Most people have heard of quinoa. Technically, it's a seed. But we'll call it like it's an ancient grain. And it can be part of salads. It can be part of soups. It can be a dish in itself. You know, it can be mixed with um, all kinds of vegetables in a stir fry. So there's wonderful quinoa. Then there's amaranth. Amaranth is very little tiny, like little balls, but they're very, very flavorful and you should give it a try. Now, oatmeal, a wonderful grain. It's fantastic for helping the gut microbiome to improve. It also, and we'll talk about this, they're binders. These fibers are also binders. So they help get the toxic waste out by binding to it. When when the liver goes through the process and then it puts everything down, what I call the trash chute, the bile duct into the intestine, if you don't have enough fiber acting as binders, then you can, just as I mentioned, you can reabsorb estrogen, you can reabsorb into your system the toxins that your liver just went to all that trouble to try to get rid of. So you need these binders, okay? So oatmeal is a fantastic binder. It's one of the best. Now, I personally love every kind of oats. So what are we talking about? There's slow-cooked oats. There is the the food that I also love called steel cut oats. They're different, they're very tasty. And then there's oat groats. That is the most fibrous is the oat groats. And buckwheat is sometimes called groats. So try these different oat products. And they're so good. I mean, and there are some people out there that are saying terrible things about oats. It's fantastic. Just don't get oats that are processed. I like to get the organic and the gluten-free because I work my life around being gluten-free. But those are fantastic. So give them a try. And what other kind? Well, there's seeds like hemp seeds that you can mix with different foods um, and other different seeds and turn into like a cereal. And it's also a wonderful binder. So seeds can also be fantastic. So add these ancient grains into your diet. They're fantastic. And then I started telling you about like seeds. So seeds are also wonderful binders and they have great fiber, usually soluble fiber. So one of my favorite seeds, like pumpkin seeds. I love them in salads, sunflower seeds, sesame seeds, and chia seeds. They're, they're so tasty. And chia seeds go great with hemp seed. And you can make that into like a pudding. You can make it into like a cereal that you can have with like organic soy milk, almond milk, oat milk, that type of thing. 
put in some nuts and seeds and, and fruit as well. And what, what am I talking about now? Fruit. So, for example, apples have pectin in them. Pectin is another wonderful binder that will bind with toxins and help you to eliminate them when you have a bowel movement. So they're great. But every kind of fruit not only has fiber, but they also have, of course, vitamins and minerals and them what I call the magical part of plants, the polyphenols. It turns out that different types of microbes love different types of polyphenols. It's like, I think of it as a dance. They kind of find each other and then they do a magical dance and then the microbes flourish. So that's why you want to eat, among other reasons, the colors of the rainbow, because all these different polyphenols match up to nourish and help to do better and flourish the different microbes of your gut microbiome. In addition, many of those polyphenols, the phytonutrients, are phytoestrogens. And that also contributes greatly to the health of the gut and to the liver. So we definitely want to eat all of these different plant-based foods, which are all under the umbrella of vegan foods. Now, what about vegetables? Every vegetable has wonderful ingredients that will help you to thrive and will help your gut and liver to do better. So you want to have the greens, all the different wonderful greens, and then you want to have the cruciferous vegetables. So what are some of the cruciferous vegetables? Broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, arugula, kale. And these are amazing as anti-cancer types of foods. And of course, they have many different other nutrients in them. And one of the interesting things about cruciferous vegetables is that they contain, and broccoli is the most famous for this, sulforaphanes which are famous, and you can take them, take them as a supplement as well, they're famous for helping with the detoxification process. And also DIM, which comes from indole-3-carbonyl, which is found in cruciferous vegetables, and then it can be metabolized into DIM, D-I-M. And that also is really helpful for the third phase, okay, what we call phase three, of liver detoxification. So you absolutely want to include a serving of the cruciferous vegetables every day. Now, don't worry about it interfering with your thyroid function. You've probably heard of that. That's pretty much when you have them raw and in enormous quantities. I've never seen anyone have a problem. So if you say that you have one really jumbo serving a day, like say two cups, a day of cruciferous vegetables, different types. My personal favorite happens to be Brussels sprouts. I just love um, broiled or grilled roasted Brussels sprouts, but there's not any cruciferous vegetable I don't love. There's so many recipes. A lot of people like cauliflower rice. So you can take cauliflower and use a grater, make it into a sort of a consistency like rice and use it as if it were rice. It's really, really delicious. You can even make it flat and make it into like the bottom of a pizza. And then you put all kinds of roasted vegetables on top, some tomato sauce, and you just made a vegan, completely gluten-free pizza. How delicious is that? So there's so many different things that you can do with these different types of vegetables. Now you want to include root vegetables. So many people say, I don't eat root vegetables. I have too much starch. That is wonderful starch. In fact, if you get the little red or purple potatoes, they have fantastic ability to be resistant starch. So you, you cook them just till they're nice and soft, and then you refrigerate them. You eat them really cold. I like to like cut them up and then chop up some like green onions, tomatoes, cucumbers. Salads are fantastic. We'll touch on that. And then you just mix it with some delicious vinaigrette, like some balsamic vinegar or another type wine vinegar. And then you add some high quality olive oil and you eat it cold. And those potatoes are resistant starch. They're the perfect food for your gut microbes and they will not raise your blood sugar one bit. In fact, none of the foods I'm talking to you about are problems in terms of creating insulin resistance or high blood sugars. They are wonderful. You need to have them and to have 
a better gut microbiome. They have shown that when you have a healthy gut microbiome, you are far less likely by, by enormous amounts to have diabetes or insulin resistance. In fact, there are published studies showing that a high fiber diet lowers your chance of having insulin resistance. It's phenomenally beneficial. The gut microbiome is intimately connected to your glucose regulation potential. So you want to nourish that gut microbiome, which requires all of these different types of plants. Now, I mentioned salads. I want you to try to have about at least one third, even one half of all of your produce raw. So you can make a giant salad. You can have all different kinds of greens. You can put in cucumbers and of course tomatoes. You can put in green onions. And what about things like string beans and any vegetable you can just add in, okay? There's like no vegetable that you can't put in. You can get like white corn that's non-GMO and you can cook it, you can cut it off the cob and add that into your salad. You can throw in the beans that we talked about into your salad. Nuts and seeds, fantastic. This is all vegan food. Now there's one more thing that you need to include. What is that? You need fermented foods. So I keep jars of really delicious, high quality sauerkraut in my refrigerator at all times. And I try to have it with most dinners as much as I can. I don't do it 100%, but kimchi is very popular. And there are other fermented foods. In fact, any crunchy vegetable can be fermented. You can have fermented beets, you can have fermented cucumbers, often called pickles, right? You can ferment peppers. So anything that has a crunch to it, celery, we're just used to cabbage, but it doesn't have to be cabbage. It could be other things. They now have studies showing that if you don't include fermented foods, you're not going to have as optimal a restoration of your gut microbial population. So we're going to go vegan for as long as you can and get lots of delicious recipes and so on. And I'll talk about in the future some of the supplements that can also help to support the detoxification pathways in your liver and help to restore the gut integrity. So that's another talk for another day. Today is recognizing that almost everyone, if not everyone, can benefit from a six month or even as long as you can, short of six months, going on a vegan detox to help facilitate the innate detoxification pathways involved in our removal of toxic products that we make and bring into our bodies. So we want to prepare for the onslaught of you know things that we may be eating over the holidays. So we are going to be prepared. And if you want, you can start this. Even if you take a break for like the holidays, you can get started now on your vegan detox. It's okay if you break it up by sometimes you know, messing up. It's okay. It's not like you have to do it perfectly for six months straight. If you mess up now and again, or it's intentional, then you just get right back into it. So if you can, start soon and enjoy the holidays. But maintain the health of your gut microbial population so that you'll have a healthy liver and you will be able to achieve optimal health.